like, yo. What's up, my peoples? What's going on? It's your man, Fire Jaws. Welcome to another Bible study that um, we're doing uh, for the Righteous and Rugged podcast. Um, I start off with Bible stuff, but not really too much with opinions so far, unless those opinions are Bible-based. But here we are. I'm going to break down 1 John, and my goal with this whole thing is to let you guys know what we have in the gospel, what is... Um, what is accessible to us, and how we can use it in everyday life. So hopefully, uh, starting today, not even hopefully, starting today with this podcast, broadcast, etc., you guys will be able to uh, look at the Word, um, break it down, and um, look at the Word, break it down, and apply it to your lives, and, and hopefully help out other people. All right? Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I'm a gospel rapper. Um I'm a minister in the Word and a teacher. Um, I have a lot of other testimonies behind that, but I really was my whole purpose of doing this. I really want to be able to enlighten us, uh, enlighten our people about what we have in the gospel, what was given to us. So, without further ado, uh, if you're going to be along with me, you can see I'm at First John, um, chapter one. There's only ten verses, so we'll go through the entire chapter. Um, it's not that long, but I guarantee we're going to get a lot out of it. I'm in blueletterbible.org in the King James Version, and 1 John 1.1 1, 1 goes like this. It says, uh, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, and that we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. Uh, this right here, John is, is uh, letting us know uh, who he is. And his identity in who he is to build up credibility in that this man already knows what he's talking about. So he's first off, he's, he's saying exactly who he is. He's saying that we have handled, we've looked upon, and we have seen, right, with our and with our hands, we've touched the word of life, right? And he's talking about Jesus, right? He's talking about Jesus. And he's saying that Jesus is from the beginning. So what he's even going further back is, is that. The actual words that created creation, this is what we have handled and have seen and have touched. And this is the word of life. This is the word of God. This is Jesus Christ, the son of God, the Messiah. We have, we've been around, we spent time with Christ and, and we know Christ. We know him intimately. And, and, and th these are my credentials. This is my ID card. And one other thing I wanted to touch on. I know uh, a few years back, you know, they were talking about identity teaching uh, and, and how wrong it is. But the problem is, is that uh, up until recent years, not even not even recently, but even until now, but starting in recent years, uh, uh, you need, I, we haven't been getting identity teaching. And that's the first thing you need. As soon as you start a job, the first thing they do is take your picture and give you an ID card. Because that ID card affords you access to be able to do your job. So if I walk into uh, an area, right, like I used to work in a data center. What that is is a bunch of, it's a room with a bunch of servers in it. <laughs> like, like YouTube or Google or something like that. They have a bunch of computer servers in there. And they don't let just anybody in there because, you know, you pull a cable, the whole system goes down. And then people's money is messed up and this and that. People get fired behind it. So what I'm saying is, is that you had to have a special level of credentials to, in order to enter the data center. So here you have to have your credentials. So when you're administering the word of God, your credibility is important, right? Now I'm not going to get into the level of hypocrisy and things of that nature, but your identity is important. So, so for somebody to come along and say uh, that your identity is, is, is doesn't, it doesn't really matter or identity teaching is dangerous, no, it's necessary. Fire is dangerous, but it's necessary. Water is dangerous, but it's necessary. Electricity is dangerous, but it's necessary. You guys get the point. So when somebody talks about identity teaching and, and you not knowing who you are, and you knowing who you are is dangerous, dangerous to who? It's, it's detrimental if you don't know who you are. 
And John not only tells you, we're going to see in these scriptures, that John not only tells you who he is, but he tells you who you are. The real question is why they don't want you to know. That's the real question. All right. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon in our hands and have handled the word of life. Now, again, with the beginning here, right? John is talking about the beginning of creation. He's not talking about the beginning of the Gospels. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He, that's John also. He's talking about the beginning of creation. That which was from the beginning. We seen it. You didn't. <laughs> so you ain't got nothing to say. You don't have one upon me. All right. Verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, you notice this is like a side comment, right? Because there's parentheses here, right? Inside those parentheses, I'm not going to get too deep into this, it's just not. But the side, the parentheses mean that this is, this is just a side note, like to put the further punctuate exactly who I am, Right, as an apostle in my, my level of credibility, the credibility of my information, who I am, and then also who he is, in case you didn't know. Verse 3 That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also, sorry, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. All right. I'm going to show you a little pet peeve that I have. See right here where it says, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship. All right. That may have is based on your choice. It's not based on the choice of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if any man comes to me, I will in no way cast him out. I won't cast him out. So here it is. It says that we, that you may have fellowship, but See where it says may have, these are two words. This right here, which is, I'm, look, I'm in the Blue Letter Bible, which is uh, the King James Version, right? BlueLetterBible.org, King James Version, right? It says that you may have. So look, G2192. That's the Greek word that was used for have. It's the word echo. Now we know echo in English to mean something else. But... Echo means, uh, what does it mean? Here it is. To have and to hold. 1A, to have, hold, in the hand, in the sense of wearing, to have, hold, possession of the mind. Refers to alarm, agitating, emotions, etc. To have, to hold fast, to keep, to have or comprise or involve, to regard or to consider, hold as. To have, own, and possess. Third three is to hold oneself or finds oneself so and so to be in such and such a condition. To hold oneself to a thing, lay hold of a thing, to adhere or cling to, and to be closely joined to a person or thing. Now, echo means, like, in English, it means, like, the echo, echo, say the word over and over, or you hear a word. And he said a word that comes back to you is the same word because that sound bounces off the walls. Kind of what it's doing in here. But that's a reverberation, but that's something different. But this, the, the, the Greek translation, right, where we get the word echo for is to means to have something, to hold something, right? So let me go back. So that you also have fellowship with us. Because may isn't there. This is why I use the, the Strong's definition, because sometimes in the translation, there's words that are there that are not there. They put words there that are not there, right? And may, in English, sometimes can insert doubt. All right? Watch, watch this. But in this case, if you do, it is, it is kind of a may, because if you choose it, then you'll have it. If you don't choose it, then you won't have it. 
that you have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Let me just say this too. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. In our language of faith, we need to speak in definites and not in doubt, not in probabilities, not in possible, not in possibilities. Like it may happen, it may not. Like this is not a, a really sure way of speaking. The way John spoke in this, he said, that we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also have fellowship with us. We need to start speaking like that in a definite speech. I mean, just to go off on that for a second, even as men, right? As a man, right, when I'm speaking with my wife, I need to be able to speak in a definite language, in a definite speech, not in the language of assurity. Because women, like my wife, she's looking for a place of security. So she needs to know that I know what I'm talking about. Or at least I feel like I know what I'm talking about and I'm confident in it. You understand? All right. But here they go again in John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. See, the word may is not even there. Look, 5600. See, may. 5600 is the word be, I'm pretty sure. All right, transliteration is O, right? Long O, O, pronunciation O, right? Strong's definition says the subjunctive may, might, can, could, would, should, must, etc. Also with G1487 and its comparative, or well, with other practices. And comparative as well. Appear, may, might, should be, as if past flower age. All right, maybe I was wrong on that. Not maybe. I was wrong on that. But it says um, B, may, be, etc. But just say B or maybe, either way. But it works. That wasn't a good example. But this doesn't put in doubt, but you still um, should speak with this. But even still, we cut out the word may. And these things write we unto you that your joy be full. It's more definite. But that's a translator thing. This then is the message, verse 5 which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. All right, I'm going to read six along with this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Point blank. Why is John so definite in this? He was definite all the way through, right? But it's, he defined something. He identified something. He identified a person and the type of person. You cannot say that you are in Christ and you walk in darkness because Christ is light. So how are you going to walk in light and walk in the dark? It doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. That's like saying I went swimming, but you didn't get wet. It doesn't make any sense. You got in a pool full of water, but you didn't get wet. You wasn't in that water. That's how John could be so definite about that. That's how. You know somebody who's walking in darkness. Are you walking in darkness? And you say you're in Christ? You're lying. It just is what it is. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a shock. Walk in the light. John also goes through that, and he talks about how to walk in the light. We lie and do not the truth. You can't do the truth because you walk in the darkness, right? So we walk in the light. Verse 7, 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, remember, there is no darkness in his light, right? Because it says here in verse five is light. God is light and in him there is no darkness. In James chapter one, let me go there real quick. I got one punch, man. Leave me alone. All right. Uh, I'm go here. James, you know, the 117, right? 117 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no variableness. It doesn't flicker on and off. There's no shadow. Even the sun casts shadows. So this light is a lot more intense. Which when we go back to what John was talking about, that's why there's no darkness. Because look, like, like how great is this light? So if you walk in darkness, you got to be lying because God's light is so great. There's no shadow. Period. If we walk in it, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one in another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's no darkness in us. Sin is darkness. If you're in the light, darkness just is gone if you're in it. That doesn't sound like I have to work so hard and to just stay out of temptation and stay out of sin. Oh, I have to work. Oh, I got to. Oh, it's just so hard. No, get in the light. It won't be hard at all. If you jumped in a river, right, that's rushing full of water, how hard would it be for you to get downstream? No effort at all, because the river's doing all the work, right? It's the same thing here. I'm not saying you don't have to do any work. The work is getting in. But once you're in, Getting out is a problem, just like a river. You'll see that. If we go to, let me go to this scripture. Uh, I believe it's First Peter. I'm going to do things a little bit slicker. Let me do this. Open a new tab. Let me go to new window. And boom. First, first Peter? I think it's First Peter. It's so funny because First Peter, First Peter is like um, I would have to go to Second Peter actually, but First Peter is so um, um, like I always get confused about which which Peter I'm talking about. But here we go. I'm sticking right here so we can see. All right, it says First uh, Peter. All right, according to his divine power. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, right? The knowledge, I'm just gonna leave that right there. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, Strongs, that by these you might be, there go might again, right? It's probably may again, right? Ooh, you know might, which means, um. To come into existence. Okay. That you would come to know all things that pertain from the life and godliness through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding and precious promises that these you'll come to know or come to be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So if we jump in this river that we was talking about, which is light, right? The light is what's getting the sin out, is cleansing us from all sin, right? So we have a divine nature. 
So what I'm saying is, excuse me, what the scripture is saying is, is that his son, the blood of his Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. So if we jump into this thing, right, through knowledge, what Peter was taught about, which I'm trying to impart today, right, there's a divine nature that we have. That divine nature allows us to stay away from sin. All right. Let me see if I can break this down a little bit different or coming from a different, uh, different um, example. I can eat whatever I want, but I don't want everything. Because of my nature, right, what's natural to me, which is relative, right, I don't want everything, so I don't eat everything. So, in this case, right, we can do in Christ whatever we want. But by our divine nature, we don't want everything. We don't. All right. Back in this. His, his blood cleanses us from all sin. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Our effort comes from the knowledge that Peter was talking about. Here it is. If we say that, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let me read the next verse for context. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If, but if we confess our sins and he is faithful, I'm sorry, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in essence, right, how can we say that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and then be in trouble for saying we have no sin? Because he's not talking about the people who walk in the light. The people who walk in darkness say they ain't got no sin. And they're lying. Number 45 has said, I don't do anything wrong to repent. I don't do anything wrong. I don't repent from anything. I don't do nothing wrong. When you were just talking crazy about how you treat women, which is abominable. And then encouraging others to do so. This is not a uh, liquor, water. We're encouraging others to do so. And a whole host of crazy stuff. You don't walk around calling countries asshole countries. That's sin. In James, it says. That you cannot, you don't, you don't, blessing and cursing don't come out of the same mouth. There's a spring water, the spring water, there's a, what did it say? There's a, uh, you don't get salt water and fresh water from the same place. This is not my job to bag on him, but I'm using him as an example because you just said that you don't even. You don't sin, so you don't have nothing to confess. When there's a whole host of things out there that point clear to the amount of sin that you walk in, you're walking in darkness, a whole host. I'm not going to go through a, a list, but there's a lot. You ain't got to. Google it. So that's what he's talking about. If we confess our sins, and let me say, let me see, let me see this. Here's another thing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The bigger thing here is, is that we have to confess it in order to get forgiveness. The very first word in this thing is if. In programming, 
Now have something called a conditional statement. Called an if-then statement. If this happens, then do this, computer. If you do this, if this happens, then do this. And then the computer will follow that happen. But if it doesn't happen, then do this. And the computer follows those instructions. So that's called an if-then statement. It's a conditional statement. So if you don't confess, he's not faithful and just to forgive your sins. He ain't forgiving nothing. This saves me from trouble. This one right here. I'm not, what I'm going into, I'm going to put a disclaimer. I'm not saying don't love people. I'm not saying don't get behind people. I'm not saying none of that. What I'm saying is, is that people have not, people have done dirt to me. And they'll say, well, why haven't you went and talked to such and such and such and such? Or why haven't you went and, you know, spoke to them about X, Y, and Z? Well, I spoke to them about it, and they act like they ain't did nothing. Yeah, I know, but if you know, if you just if you just talk to them and and you deal with them and this and that, listen. If somebody can't be held accountable for the things that they do, then how are we gonna have a relationship? Because you're gonna turn around and do the same thing again. And sometimes it's messed up, but. It doesn't mean I don't love them. It doesn't mean I don't care about them. But we can't go forward because you have this. This is something that's going to keep us apart. It's an offense that if it keeps happening, we can't reconcile. So it works the same thing with Christ and everybody else. You have to reconcile with Him, and all He wants is for you to just say, "I'm sorry." That's all just about anybody wants. We watched this thing with Will Smith and um, Janet Janet Hubert. And, you know, they both confessed, you know, that Will Smith destroyed her career. And she was hurt deeply behind that. And she confessed that she said some really hard things about them on the Internet. And they came together and they said they were sorry. And when you have that face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, the things change, your energy changes. It does. But if if Will didn't own up to his stuff, which, I mean, it was dope that he did. I, I, I gave him crazy props for that. And she owned up to her stuff, the things that she said, which she really had a reason and right to say. But yet and still, they owned up to it. It was amazing. So the fact of the matter is, is that they got that out of the way because they had that talk. And Will was man enough to do it. He didn't have to do it, but he did, which was dope. So what I'm saying is, is that that ain't nothing new. Jesus, Jesus is the same way. We got it. If we got some stuff going on in our lives that's messing us up and this and that, we need to take accountability for it. And we need to speak up for it and own your stuff. You just do. We all do. But until that happens, don't expect the lovey-dovey relationship to be going on between you and the person that was offended. You may say all that stuff, and then still there won't be a relationship. But not with Jesus. Because he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. Now, if there are people that approach me and said, hey, yo, bro, I'm sorry. I did X, Y, and Z. Da, 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 da. I, I, I am bound to forgive them. I am bound to erase it. And will do so happily. I will. And that's the line that we have to draw between um, loving people and accepting people, right? And just not putting up with your stuff. You're not going to abuse me. Right? And I've done things to people that have, that man, ouch, I have. Got to own up to that stuff, man. Just got to own up to it. So even if there isn't a conversation or there is a conversation, whatever, but you better have that conversation with Christ.
You better have that conversation with him. You better. Next verse, and the last one. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So that's how you identify. That's how you identify right there. At least say you sin. If you're walking in darkness, but that's that'd be kind of like a catch twenty two because if you say that you're if you say that you haven't sinned, you really won't acknowledge that you're walking in darkness. And if you're walking in darkness, then you you really won't acknowledge the light. So I guess, I guess it can be safe to say that the more sin that you walk in, the harder it is it's going to be to get out. You just have to acknowledge it. That's all you have to do is acknowledge it. What's on the other end of that thing is forgiveness. If you acknowledge it and repent, why would why would a person acknowledge that they've killed hundreds of people, or 17 people, or 20 people, or whatever? They acknowledge it, but you know they're gonna they acknowledge. Yeah, I, I I kill people. I kill people all the time, and I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and do it tomorrow. When the yo, we can't have a relationship. I might be the next one you decide to kill. We can't have no relationship. Nah. So the fact of the matter is, is that like with that acknowledgement has to come repentance. There has to be a willingness to say, no, I can't do this anymore. And even make reparations in that case too. All right. That was the 10th verse. Uh, next time we're gonna we're gonna go to First uh, John chapter two and walk through that, which is a little bit more. But I hope you guys can take away something. Right now, you can identify who is in the light and who is in darkness, including yourself, right? Including myself. I looked at the scripture and I see that if I confess my sin to Christ, He is faithful. And just to forgive my sins, right? That's the first step is me walking in the light. Just because somebody says they are of the light, says they are in Christ, we can tell by your actions if you are. We can tell by your words if you are. We don't know everything about the light yet, but we do know that ain't no darkness in it. And if somebody's walking in darkness, that's where you walk at. That's where you live consistently. We know you're not who you say you are. It just is what it is. That's probably why identity teaching is so dangerous. Because if you know these things, you'll be able to find out stuff about others. And not rock with them like that no more. So, all right, till next time, this is Fire Jars. It's your man out. This is the Rights and Rugged Podcast. Uh, Bible study. See you next time. Uh, if you if you haven't already, like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at twitter.com forward slash firejaws. Uh, Instagram, firejaws. Uh, Facebook, firejaws. Uh, you can friend me on Facebook if you want. David Hobday, firejaws. Um, and uh, catch me there. Until next time, it's your man Jaws. Peace.